Welcome in to a special edition of the Vandy Sports Podcast. Today, we've got Vanderbilt football coach Clark Lee joining us, along with my co-host, Will Purdue. Our podcast is presented by Dr. Jody Jones, DDS. We are part of the 440 Sports Network. Our guest line is presented by Michael Kendrick of the Kendrick Group. Michael is a local carpenter and a lifelong Vandy fan. He builds bookshelves, cabinets, picture frames, furniture, and made-to-order items, including a display case. For my prize Dale Murphy jersey, which if you could see my whole office, you would see over one of my shoulders. I've seen Michael's work. He's a true craftsman. If you're in the market for custom woodwork, give Michael a call at 615-830-9458. Clark, if you got any jerseys you need framing, I, I can hook you up. So I got a few. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you have do you have some game balls you've collected from this year? Because five wins in your second season, that was a a nice accomplishment, two league wins. I know the season didn't end the way you wanted to, but you had a lot of nice moments in between. Talk about those and just reflect on the progress of where you are at the end of your second year. Well, cert certainly we, you know, we took time to celebrate progress, you know, when we were able to. And, uh, you know, we, I think we're still kind of getting over the pain and disappointment of the finish. But, um, you know, that'll be important fuel for us forward. I mean, this is all about continuing to close those gaps and and to, and to make progress as a program. And I think we have some really clear um, sight lines to what comes next for us. Uh, the, you know, the the win at Kentucky was was a special one um, as the first SEC win and and uh, really a game where everything came together for this for this team. And um and then to back that up with a win against Florida at home, to share that with the home crowd was, you know, that was awesome. And I think for all of us involved, you know, just getting getting the opportunity to to um, to feel that feeling and to hopefully capture it and know that we want to do more of that moving forward, um, you know, that was special for us. By the way, I was remiss in thanking you off the jump. Didn't didn't mean to. To forget that so thank you for joining us at a busy time for you I, I guess when you're an SEC football coach it's always a busy time but what is it like right now you've got signing day coming up in a couple of weeks you've got the portal is about to open up tomorrow what is life like for you this time of the year well I think where, where you need uh where you want to kind of sit back and relax we, we'd love to be in bowl prep right now by the way so that's that's going to be the goal moving forward but you know, life speeds up after the season. The season provides you routine and you kind of get in this rhythm where, you know, you know what to expect Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, on, so on and so forth, all the way Saturday. Um, anymore, this is a this is a really important time for roster management. You know, we, we've had a lot of ongoing conversations and um, important conversations, and that'll help us shape this team and this program moving into the future. On top of that, you know, I'm not going to be there's going to be very few times that I'll be in this office over the next few weeks as I'll be out traversing the country and recruiting. Um, and then when I am home, we're going to be hosting recruits on official visit weekend. So it's nonstop. But, you know, this is I'm, I'm, I'm just so excited and particularly excited with, um, you know, recruiting to the tangible signs of progress, excited by the energy that I'm, I'm feeling from the, the players that are returning and the work they've already started to put in on the weight in the weight room, which is awesome. And um, it's just, it's a cool time, but certainly not one where our feet are up on the desk and we're relaxing. Hey Clark, I know you're really good at deflecting in the sense of, you know, talking about the importance of, you know, the, the players and what they mean to this program, but I'm going to uh, take a, uh, a Greg Popovich, euphemism and one of the things he talked about is he was rebuilding the spurs much like you are doing now that you're rebuilding the commodore football team was is you know the reality is as a coach you have to sit back and really reflect on what it is you're trying to accomplish and how you're accomplishing that how has <clears throat> Clark Lee, the head coach changed from the time you walked on campus as an assistant from Notre Dame to Clark Lee now, who, listen, I don't, whether you want to agree or not, I feel like you've kind of expedited the process a little bit because not only did you get one SEC win, you got two SEC wins. So now, you know, the goalposts are always changing and the expectations are rising. 
you know, what is it that you've learned about yourself that you need to continue to push forward to make yourself a better coach? Yeah, well, um, for, first of all, I, I, I would agree that, you know, you don't really know what to expect until you're in location. And when I when I set foot on this campus and, and started to learn about where this program was, um, and I'm not even talking about the external perception of where the program was, which, you know, obviously I was aware of, but I'm talking about internally where we were. It, it, it was sobering with the, with the climb ahead. I mean, you, you understood the challenge that we were taking on and that it would take time. Um, I think that first season, you know, we went two and 10 and, and our two wins were a come from behind victory against Colorado State, who, you know, was a underperforming team and, and then a come from behind victory at home against UConn. And um, that's certainly not how I drew that up. Uh, so, again, you were just confronting the reality of where we were and where we are and how we needed to, to move forward. I was really impressed with how this roster, um, it was almost like, we, you know, there was there was quite a bit of subtraction and then addition with the recruiting class, but also just the, t the, the team that came back, the team that chose to continue this journey. Um, doubling down on their efforts and training and, and getting bigger, faster, stronger. You know, when I looked at the difference between spring one and spring two, um, and I did this with our team, it was, it was remarkable. The, the contrast between the way the man, the style with which we were playing, the speed with which we were playing our commitment to the design and our operation. So we saw, we saw progress happening. It, it's still to me, the biggest hurdle at Vanderbilt is a psychological hurdle. Um, it's, it's, it's the, the mentality it takes to win. And, and what that means is you're going to put the work in, but, and all that's important, but on Saturday, the ball's teed up and kicked off and you have to make it happen. Um, and it's not always going to be linear. You're not going to have a good first quarter, a good second quarter, a good third quarter, a good fourth quarter. You're going to have to combat the ups and downs, um, that we know happen in the competitive moment. Um, and you have to be willing to step into each moment, play in the present and make the available play. And we weren't able to do that early in the season in the SEC. You know, we were we were struggling. Obviously, we went through a really tough stretch um, against opponents that we were we were punching up. And it was just, you know, we weren't playing well enough, but we were also, um, you know, playing against some really good teams. It was exciting to see that that come together um, again against Kentucky and then for us to replicate that and start to show some consistency in it, um, I think it's a sign of a good program. Um, as far as your question about my own development, like ah, it's it, it feels night and day. And a lot of that, you know, has to do with as a as a position coach and as a coordinator, you have so much uh, control and you know, it's your message. It's, you know, you're coaching through individual, you're coaching through scout periods. You're just con they're hearing your voice constantly in this position. You know, so as a head coach, I think that's where you start. And in my first year, I was, I was having so many meetings in my office and so many interventions with players. What I realized was that I was taking on the job that I needed my assistants to do and my coordinators to do. And, it's just a kind of a sloppy way to lead is to say, you know, I'll do it myself. Um, and so w one of the biggest shifts for me has been recognizing that that's not sustainable. It's not efficient, um, that I've got a good staff and I've got people capable of, of um, taking ownership over there, you know, farming their land, so to speak, that I need to empower them to do that, that I've got to be really clear in the expectations I set, I've got to be really clear in holding people accountable um, to those expectations. But that I need to empower them to, to move this program forward in those everyday interactions. And what's as important is that as they do that, that they take on the program language and the program message. You know, I'm only as strong as they're willing to support, you know, the, again, the language, the message, the direction of the program. And so um, we spend a lot of time now as a staff, I mean, every day kind of crafting that message, crafting the narrative, you know, again, holding account to the things that are most important early in on this build. And as I strengthen as a head coach, I think those expectations become explicit rather than implicit, that we continue to build on our efficiency, that I have, I spend less time 
um, you know, spraying my energy in places that aren't effective when it comes to what it takes to win. And that, that, that's where my development has come. And that's where it needs to continue to head for us to be as good as we, we feel like we can be. So Chris, I have two questions. And the first one on the follow-up with that is what you were talking about from the player's standpoint. And I think you said this in one of your Tuesday coaches uh, press conferences, I have this uh, piece of paper now. I've got a lot of the, the Clark Lee statements <laughs> that you make because I, I really like them. You know, you talked about the season, collective force, dictate terms, you know, handle adversity. But you said something that really stood out to me. I think this is something that CEOs would like to hear, other coaches, high school, uh, you know, uh, me as when I was coaching my son's, uh, you know, fourth grade basketball team. You mentioned belief without evidence. And my wife was listening to the press conference. I was watching it on TV and she was just, she didn't even know what she was doing. She was just like doing this on her phone. And she's like, that's called faith. How do you get your players? Because as you talked about now, you guys are constantly having your meetings day in and day out. You know, I was fortunate enough to come to a meeting and you're, you're one set of eyes, but yet you got a hundred some set of eyes looking at you and you're, you're hammering home the message of belief without evidence. We're changing the culture. We're changing the program. How do you change the message, but keep the message the same so that the players continue to keep fighting forward? Yeah, I think we have to do a really good job of kind of narrating the experience for, for these guys. Meaning like, um, you know, the message has to shift to address where the shortcoming, where the gaps are. I've got to be really good at showing those gaps, showing the evidence on film, and then and then you know expressing and explaining how our habits shifting, our behavior shifting will impact change in those areas. It, it, it's a um, probably one of the more challenging parts of this job is to is to is to stay you know focused because what you want to do. I, I, when we're at our best, it's it's the channeling of that energy. It's it's like you know we say laser focus, right? Like if we are um, distracted, or if those messages become multiple, if if I'm not specifically addressing the things that need to be changed, then we we can't make progress. And there were times this year that I maybe felt like I I, I was a little late coming into the message that the team needed. Um, but we got there and I, I felt like one of the most important parts of this build was um, or this season was after the Missouri game where, you know, we, you know, we had a, a game that was winnable. We had a game that also at 17, nothing at halftime could have gotten away from us, you know, and the message at the halftime for the defense was there's, there's no reason that this team scores another point to go take control of the game. They did that offensively, you know, it's funny, you know, you, you keep waiting for this, you know, the, the, the magnificent play that's going to spark the, the comeback. And that play was just a hitch. We threw a hitch to Gamarion Carter and he's good enough to take it all 80 yards to the house. You know, that, that was the idea that the, the explosive play comes through the available play. You know, you, you, you just start to build language and the narrative around what we're doing and when we came up short on fourth and inches in that game in a two minute drive, and uh, we were heading into a bye week, um, I knew that I was gonna be in front of a team both after the game and then on Monday that was gonna need to understand how close they are. And it can't be, you're so close, you know, and you're saying that every week, It's it's gotta be, it's gotta come from the heart and it's gotta come from your experience. And so we, um, and in fact, you know, we, we used, we used a quote that I know that Popovich has used with the Spurs, but it's the stone cutter um, and the idea that, you know, uh, the stone cutter hammering away at the rock sometimes a hundred times without a crack showing. And then on the hundred and first blow, um, the rock splits in two. And he knows it wasn't the hundred and first blow, but all that came before that, that really became kind of the mantra of our program. Um, and, and what I told them was, and it wasn't just me, I allowed for other other coaches, you know, I think sometimes sharing that stage and sharing that message is important so long as it's aligned. But I had guys get up and talk about in front of the team about how close we are, how uh, in our experience as coaches, this is what we've seen 
a team need to go through to get to the breakthrough point. And for us, the stone cutter represented faith to our process and uh, building to the breakthrough. And uh, to this team's credit, you know, they listened. Um, I think their their belief in me and their belief in our coaching staff has everything to do with the nature of the relationships we built up into that moment where you're calling them in. Um, and it worked. And, you know, we won't deviate from that because that's our formula right now. But um, certainly it took some discipline and, and some um, focused messaging there to, to pull the best out of this team. You know, and, and the second thing was um, you mentioned with your coaching staff and with you empowering and trusting the coaches, um, knowing how much responsibility there is on you as the head coach, because, you know, you, you have to answer all the questions. How difficult is that, you know, A, you're, you're, you're testing your ability to hire the right coach for this group of kids, but B, you having the, the, the trust and the faith that you hired the right guy that you can step back and allow them to get their job done. How difficult is that? Well, you know, it's really challenging. There's constant evaluation. I mean, you know, we go through a process in hiring where, you know, I feel like we're vetting people out and, and learning about um, who they are as men and who they are as tacticians. And, you know, um, you know, we're very specific about kind of what, what the formula looks like right now for this program to win. A lot of these guys I've had personal experience with, that helps. Um, and so um you know for me um you know when i know i i don't want it to be a situation where i'm hiring my buddies i want it to be where my experience tells me that this person's a great fit and i've seen them um be effective for us at vanderbilt and again my awareness of the history of this program that starts with a, a, a an ability to form an authentic relationship. Like our kids need to feel inspired when they walk and walk in the building. Football has got to become something they look forward to every day. And to me, that has everything to do with the the, the men that are leading them in those position rooms. So, um, a willingness to invest in holistic development, a willingness to invest in the person before the player, a willingness to listen when our guys are inevitably experiencing the adversity that eighteen to twenty two year olds exist. If I have alignment anywhere, it's in that. And so that is a non-negotiable for me, it's particularly early in the build of this program. This can't just become about X's and O's. Um, it's just not where we are. From there, you know, there has to be a commitment to the program design. And so we're not going to win right now by going out and trying to, you know, snap it 100 times in the game um, and putting our defense in challenging positions. And defensively, we're not going to win by you know, selling the house every snap and exposing ourselves to explosive plays. You know, we have to play complementary. All three phases have to interlock. And so the coaches need to understand that and need to deliver on that as they design the strategies for each game. Um, and, you know, the other thing too is just, um, you know, with the coordinators, yeah, I've had experience, you know, competing against these guys. And so, you know, sometimes the best way to interview someone is to actually like for Joey Lynch, for example, to try to stop him. And in 2018, when he was at Ball State, he brought a team in the South Bend and they played us to one score. It was, um, and I thought it was a remarkable performance from their offense. It was a well-coached, well-designed, um, challenging uh, team to defend. And and that was, that was the moment that I learned about Joey Lynch. And so, you know, it's all those factors that come in, but you have to have alignment in certain areas I think particularly with where this program is um, because we needed to build passion and energy around the playing of football for these players. They had, they had lost touch with the value of it. They had lost touch with how meaningful the experience was. And I wanted, I wanted men and women around them that that could show them the value and could um, reconnect them with that meaning and purpose. And, you know, that's been the number one priority. Clark, you talk all season about measuring performance against Vanderbilt and how good the players can be, how good the team can be, that sort of thing. When you go back and look at the whole year by that measuring stick, where did you guys measure up and where did you guys maybe lack a little bit across the course of the season? In terms of you're saying measuring against kind of what our expectations are or were? Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, we have, there's, there's a few factors, right? You're talking about on-field talent and execution. Um, you're talking about, um, you know, playing in, in the best league in the country. And then, um, you know, assuming that everything comes together and the mentalities there, you know, what, what is the potential for this team uh, to accomplish? And, and I never like to set, you know, a bar for a team that, that makes my expectation something that's easily easy to achieve. Our starting point was, you know, two and 10, like I said, and comeback wins against Colorado state and UConn. And so heading into the season, you know, I, I don't look at each game and say, well, we should win this one, but not it's, to me, it's like, here's what I want. I want these kids, I want our process to be pure. If if we, and I'm talking about any decision-making process we have. So as coaches, when we design the plan to win, you know, how are the three phases going to perform? Where, where are we going to be more aggressive on offense than we normally would be maybe because we feel like we have an advantage there? You know, where are we going to be more aggressive on defense because we feel like we're going to be able to score points and we want to try to create early separation, you know, where are we going to be aggressive on special teams to try to create an explosive play, so on and so forth. And for each play that's called, I want to know the process that delivered us to that play call. You know, I don't see it as my job to question the bad calls. That just makes me a fan. You know, what I need to do is say like, what, what got us to the point of that call? What was the strategy or the, 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 the reason for that particular call in that moment? And if the process is good and, and the call was bad, then either it's the execution of the play or we need to just shift our process a little bit. I say that just to say we don't ever go into a game where we're not executing a plan not to be competitive, but a plan to win. Um, and so back to your question, how does this how does this season measure against our expectations? I knew this team was going to be able to win games. But I also knew that we still had to overcome a psychological hurdle. What I learned about the team early, you know, when we handled that Hawaii trip, um, I thought really well. I saw the coming together of leadership and some maturity there, some competitive maturity that 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 really uh, I felt like gave me reason to to kind of see, you know, a, a high level of performance. I know the opponent wasn't what we're going to be measured against, but I'm talking strictly how we handled our business. Um, you come back against Elon and you see a first half where we're able to create distance, you know, with them and a second half where they essentially turned our formula onto us. We were um, not able to extend drives on offense. We were not able to get stops on third down on defense. They won the second half. I mean, Elon outscored us in, in the second half and, um, that game was way too close. So then you see a team that still is is looking for that foundation, still is looking to to pull to pull a, a total team performance out. Um, and then we played Wake. And what Wake's told me was that you know when bad things happen to this team, they can snowball, and we have to really step back and look at you know how we're getting to the game and how we're coaching this team and who are the people that are on the field to give our team a chance to unlock performance and not to go game by game. But I felt like, you know, as we went, I learned more and more about this team and what this team was capable of. Obviously there was a moment there in the second bye week where we then play South Carolina, where you feel like if we've, if we pulled the learning forward each week, that we're going to have an opportunity to, to beat a, a good South Carolina team at home, but a, a South Carolina team that, to that point had shown inconsistency. You know, um, you, you, you look at, you know, Kentucky and Florida and you know that there are gonna be opportunities there. And, and, um, and anyways, what, what, I, what I felt like was um, we were still in search of an identity. And the challenge to this team coming out of the bye week was this group is responsible for the formation of our identity as a program. If we were able to lock that into place, you know, what we were saying internally was this is a fight to extend our season. That's what we were saying. That means we wanted to get to postseason play, which reflects a belief that we were we were 
capable of doing that. Um, you know, once we got past South Carolina, it became we have way more control over what's happening than we were admitting to. You know, I go back to South Carolina and I think about a third and six where Quincy Skinner is wide open on a mesh concept and we get beat on our slide side, which just means where we had our protection set and should have been secure. We got, we got someone, we were short in a set and we got beat that forced AJ off his mark. We're not able to make the completion. You know, that's an explosive play and maybe a touchdown. You look at um, a fourth and four going into half where we design a little pick route against man coverage. We don't hit Jade McGowan in the flat. We end up throwing the ball to Ray Davis. We, 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 uh, we end up turning the ball over on downs that gave way to their drive. So at that point we're down 10, that gave way to their drive at the end of the half where they convert a third and 19 and end up scoring a touchdown and put a 17 point gap between us and them. You look at the way they scored touchdowns in the first half. It wasn't always in design. It was in making the available play, downing the ball on the perimeter, so on and so forth. When you look at that, you say the difference between us being tied at half or down three points or down seven points doesn't come down to South Carolina. It comes down to Vanderbilt. So at what point are we going to seize those opportunities and actually put some pressure on the opponent? Well, that was the message. It was delivered very matter of fact on Monday. And when we got to Kentucky, we did that. And Chris, I, I've, I've gone through this spectrum just to say this to you. You know, I saw as this team came together and you saw the emergence of Jaden McGowan and Quincy Skinner and Gamarian Carter and how Ray Davis was running the ball. And I felt like how our defense was strengthening I felt like at the middle of season that postseason was a real possibility. Obviously, we came up short on that, but um, I'm both disappointed and falling short on that goal, but also pleased with the progress. And I think the further we distance ourselves from the last game, the more that I'm going to connect with the ground we covered to set up a launching point for Team 3. Will, I'm going to ask him a couple more, um, yeah. then I'll let you ask a couple, then we need to get to the mailbag where we're not going to probably have too many, too much time to do many of those. But um, I want to ask you about your roster next year. It feels like you've got a chance to be really old, which is a winning formula. Um, I want you to comment on that aspect and where you feel about recruiting and, and keeping your roster safe from the transfer portal when that opens up here in a couple of days. Well, I feel like we are, um, you know, we're, we're positioning ourselves to be competitive and to retain our roster. I think we're still, you know, our, our collective has just gotten online and we're, we're, we're bolstering those efforts. And that, that's not, that's just to say, you know, we, we want to, we don't want to fall short in any aspect of the experience. You know, we're not going to go into NIL and, and think that, you know, this is about bidding wars to us, or this is somehow, there's still value here that exists in the education and then in the experience that we're providing and the support and the people that are around these players every day, you know, uh, um, uh, people are still motivated by the same things. You know, obviously opportunity to earn money based off market value is important, but what's also important is a sense of belonging and a sense of support and being challenged. And those are things that we, that we can be really good at. Um, you know, we're going to need to turn over some of this roster. That's just inevitably what growth requires of you. And so, you know, really having some honest conversations this week around, hey, where we are, where we're headed. There's still this COVID year um, that that creates a little bit of a log jam. And, you know, we have to navigate the numbers and kind of navigate through that in a way that both gives us a chance to retain experience, but also this program needs new growth too. And we need to make sure that we're, you know, bringing in recruiting classes here that that we can grow into um, the team that we know that we can have, you know, in the next couple of years. So there's a balance there. I think um, I feel good about where we are in retaining our team. Obviously, I think as the portal opens up that every coach in the country is going to is going to maintain conversation and kind of keep our knees bent. Um, I believe that where we do have gaps that we're going to be able to fill those um we're needed in, in the in the transfer portal too um and um and then also you know plug in a, a really good recruiting class to keep the youth of this roster ingrained because we're age is a competitive advantage as you mentioned 
I, I also think retention and system is a competitive advantage. So if you look up in three years, we'd like to think that we've had a player in our system for three years going into a fourth year where they're so comfortable and they're so dialed in that um, that gives us a really good chance to put distance between us and our competition. Last one from me before I turn it over to Will. I know the the season ticket issue attendance has been an issue for a long, long time. Um, the, the topic of getting outnumbered in your home stadium, I know, is not an easy one to talk about. But how do you guys go about as a program changing that? Maybe, and, and I know you're not in ticketing, but no, surely there's got to be some top down in terms of how do we get you know, we being Vanderbilt, you guys, how do you get more of your guys in the building? Yeah, I, and I answered this question, um, you know, um, I think the Tuesday of the Tennessee week, I, and I said something effective, that's not my job. You know, at that point, there, there's nothing really to do, right? I mean, our, our focus at that point has to be on getting the team ready to play. And so, um, you know, I, I, I do think as we step back, the, the number one thing that's going to create um, you know, um, mo to motivate the fans that are out there and they're there is just as we continue to enhance the product on the field, we got to, we got to focus on, uh, building this roster out and getting people excited about coming to watch Vanderbilt play. And I think that this season, you know, we had that late push and, you know, I think that's going to fuel us forward. I think you're going to see, um, an energy and, and a turnout that starts to shift as a result. I've always felt like, if I got the internal heartbeat of this program right, that over time that would bleed out. But this program doesn't get built without a relentless focus on what's inside first, because we got to break through all the scar tissue here. We got to get past the trauma. We got to we got to shift the internal narrative of this program, and and I think external will react to that. I absolutely, um, you know, want to rally that support too, and I do see that as part of my charge. I'm a Nashvilleian, man. This is my city. This is my school. You know, I want to get I want to get this community connected with our team because, you know, I think once they recognize how special these guys are and what they do and you know how impressive they are, it's easy to get behind them. And as we continue to grow the program, the product on the field shifts. There has to be a willingness to roll our sleeves up, get out in the community, market the program build excitement. And I think in time, what you're going to see is Nashville will adopt this program. The more that we represent the toughness that defines Nashville as a city, the character that defines, uh, uh, defines Nashville as a city, the fun that defines Nashville as a city. I want, you know, First Bank Stadium to be uh, on a 630 night kick to be the party that starts, you know, Broadway. Um, I just don't plan on being down on Broadway because I got work to do. Hey, uh, Chris, why don't we go ahead and ask um, two or three questions from the mailbag real quick as I'll finish up. I got two that I don't think the coach thought I would ask that he won't be ready for, and then I got a closer that I, and we'll be done. Okay, let's go to the mailbag that is sponsored by Sutherland and Belk, a family-owned injury law firm. If you or a loved one has been hurt in an accident, give Taylor or Russell a call. That number is 615-846-6200. See what your rights are and if they can help. First one, how the red shirts develop physically this summer and fall? Any specific individuals you would like to have make significant contributions next year that didn't have a chance to do so in 2020? You know, um, obviously the red shirts are on a, a different training schedule than the, the team that's playing. And so they have more opportunities to train through the fall. And on Fridays, they do like a developmental lift at that's um I think it's a bonding it's like shared suffering you know and um had great energy through the season coach Horgan's done a good job with them we see some real physical changes um but the the fun part is those guys that got here in the summer the first month is learning just kind of the methodology the second month is you know kind of you know really you know maybe like untraining some of the the habits or the body comp that they came in with and so you don't see a lot of advancement through the summer. This winter is going to be huge for this group. Um, and, you know, I think what I, what, I was, what I was excited about in watching this group play and as we got to the end of the season, 
was the performance on our look team. So, you know, I look at our kind of look team offense and look team defense and see them playing with energy and making plays and getting spirited about what they're doing. Um, you see a passion for the build as we've had meetings this week with these guys um, and, and to see the look in their eye and the, the forward lean and how excited they are to turn the page and, and to, to work on building the career that they want. You know, they all came here to play. So I think they finally recognize, they know the process it's going to take. They're familiar with the coaches and the schemes. You know, they, they physically, they're going to be positioned to launch. This spring is going to be a lot of fun, you know, and, and I think on the back end of a winter where we're training, we're adding weight, and we're we're diving into our systems, you know, um, with meetings and and opportunities for the players to get out on their own and throw and and um, and work through you know fits and coverage schemes defensively. I think we're going to see a dialed in group in the spring, and we're going to add this influx of redshirt talent that that um, it'll be a lot of fun to watch. The next one, TB Graham would like to know, how do you see Dericky Wright evolving position-wise? Is he going to stay at safety or move to linebacker? We'll, we'll keep him, um, you know, on the back end. He, he adds versatility. And so there are times when from the safety position, we, we have him drop down and cover tight ends. And so he can be involved in the box and he's shown an ability to do that. What I'm excited about for Dericky is, you know, what when he didn't get last year was an off season. If you remember, he wasn't with us in the winter and the spring. Um, that's going to be huge for him. And I know he's excited for that, but I'm anxious to see him reshape himself and, and um, you know, just start to explore the physical possibilities there. Uh, again, you know, bigger, faster, stronger and, and um, in better condition. I think I think we're still learning about what his potential could be. We were pleased with his performance. There's obviously areas for us to strengthen, but I think we're going to get that done um, through the training in the off season. Hey, Chris, Maybe I know we like, only had a chance sure. to two questions, but I know Coach has got to leave here momentarily because he's busy and we appreciate his time. But yeah. I wanted to finish up. I got two questions that are humorous that I need him to answer, and then I have a question that I want him to close on. So. I've I've always wondered, Coach. I still have hair. This isn't yeah. this isn't a, a shot at you, yeah. but I do want to know how often do you have to shave the dough? You know, once a week is generally what I do, and um, if I let it go longer than that, I I can start looking. You know, it's funny. I like I feel like I've aged. You know, ten years in the last two, but. Um, <laughs> do I start looking old as the stubble comes out? So I try to keep it as tight as possible. Now, as I go into break time and I take, we're, as a family, we'll head to Montana. I'll come back looking like a mountain man. Unfortunately, I can't, I can't quite get it going on top, but uh, it'll be a bad look. All right. Gonna next pictures one. of that. Yeah, <laughs> maybe they, maybe we'll get some pictures. Um, I'm curious, you know, as a, as a former athlete, we always think about, how important music was for motivation, for focus. What was your music as a player? And now what is your music that you listen to as a coach? Yeah. So um, like if I could, you know, what I can remember, like, like it was yesterday is, um, is like blaring rage against the machine as a player. And like, you know, I mean, I, I remember I, John Sisk was our string coach and I brought the CD in because back then that's how we functioned. Right. And I said, you know, play this to the, in the weight room. And of course there was, there was bad language on it. So he, he wouldn't do it because coach Johnson wasn't, wasn't going to let us get away with that. But, you know, I was, I mean, I, I wanted to listen to music that was going to get me fired up and, you know, uh, get the endorphins up and, um, that was kind of how I rolled as a player. You know, I was a fullback, so I was I was a battering ram, and I needed the motivation. As a coach, it's it's all um, kind of easy listening. <laughs> it's like now it's like how do I get my blood pressure down? So um, you know, th it's going to be way you know like um, I, I like some of the the you know kind of uh, indie country uh, Tyler Childers and. Um, stuff like that. Nathaniel Ratliff. I mean, just like things that, yeah, it's just, we, 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 we keep it, uh, we keep it uh, low key in here. 
Hey, uh, so this is a, a an interjection. Would you admit that you listen to Kenny G now? No, Kenny G. Uh, <laughs> I haven't stooped to that level, but um, hey, Will, when I do that, uh, come check on me because something's wrong. Okay. All right. Last question. The one thing I learned when I was a player that I thought was hammered home to me more so when I left Vanderbilt was that for a coach to truly be successful, uh, Tim Corbin style, um, is it's Vanderbilt, it just, I've always felt it. not every coach can succeed at Vanderbilt because we've seen coaches come in and use excuses that there's too many limitations for me to be successful. And they have excuses on why things didn't work. I've always felt that to be successful at Vanderbilt, it takes a very special coach, but it also, it has to be personal. And that's dangerous from a coaching standpoint because it is personal. But I think you fit that bill perfectly because you played there. You understand the challenges, but how have you walked walk that tightrope of it being personal, but that personal approach has not been detrimental? Well, it is personal. Um, I have to keep a focus on impact. Like it, it's personal, but it's not about me, right? It's personal, but it's about the growth of our program. It's personal, but it's about connection with our community. It's not about me. If I'm, if I'm to be successful in this role, what that means to me is that we build this point to a point of sustainability. And truthfully, I think right now, what I'd say to you is part of that success is about you know, getting this community motivated and getting them inspired with a vision for the program that they want to, because we need that level of feeling of impact and feeling of investment right now. Um, but success to me says, hey, we build this over time. It gets to a level of sustainability and I pass it on to the next person to take it further. Because in the end, this is going to be the place I come back to that's my home. And I want Vanderbilt to be successful for a really long time. And so it's personal to me, but it's not about me. I also feel like every day that I walk in this office, if I don't, um, you know, put my ego in a box and focus solely on what, what I am uh, bringing to the players every day, the, the, the person that I am modeling to them, how I'm inspiring them, how I'm giving them context for what their experience is. And, and empowering them to make the next step or to take the next step to make the choice they need to make to move this program forward, that level of impact is what's going to change Vanderbilt. And so um, there are moments of frustration. Hey, listen, Saturday night was one of them. And Will, it is painful. And I don't wish that feeling on anyone. But in so many ways, my job isn't to coach from that pain. My job is to move past that pain to coach this group forward and to recognize the things that we're doing well and be really um, objective when it comes to where are the areas that we need improvement. And I'm not going to be able to get this flipped overnight. So it's sometimes not about getting from A to Z. It's like, how do I get from A to B? And what is the message needed to do that? Um, I agree with you. I think it's too easy at a place like Vanderbilt to point out where things are challenging. You know, it's really important for me to look at the things that are perceived to be challenges, to see them as strengths, and to use them to channel the performance we want on the field. One of the, one of the core values that I have is better people make better players. And everything that our players interface with on this campus strengthens them in their performance. Show me a detailed person off the field. I'll show you a detailed player on the field. All of this is an effort to um, to get this program to the highest level. And we also have the baby Jack. Do you want to say hi, buddy? Um, <laughs> as an hey, assistant. Can, can you can you get him to do the uh, the Halloween thing? You you want to do the breakdown or no? No, he's not gonna do it right now because he's being shy. But he is the 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 secret uh, weapon, baby Jack. <laughs> awesome. I feel like I've missed something, but, uh, <laughs> Clark, uh, thank you so much. Um, I know this is a busy time of year for you, not just with, with the portal opening up with signing day coming the holidays. Um, 
really appreciate you taking your time to join us today. And, and I know your, your fan base will too. Oh, Hey, my pleasure. What I'd like to do is I think there was like 56 questions, Chris, let's do this yeah. again. Let, you know, I, I, you know, we'll, we'll get another one on the schedule so that we get those questions asked because, you know, I want to engage with this fan base and make sure they know that uh, as their coach, you know, I'm fighting for the program that they want to pull for too. So I appreciate you guys. This has been a lot of fun. Will, thanks for getting me out of my comfort zone a little bit, man. You, you know how to do that. Uh, Y'all take care. Thanks for the opportunity to be with you. We'll be here for that. Thank you so much, Clark. All right. Thank you. You bet.